what's the best landing page structure you see working right now? You really want to just answer five or four or five questions over and over again. What's the product? Why does it exist? How's it going to benefit me? If I order today, when does it get here? And how does it compare to the competition? If you just keep answering those five questions, you've pretty much got a landing page that'll work. My mom's our CFO. Your mom is yes. be very careful about Oh, trust me. <laughs> I, have to, I have to make sure every charge is valid. Yeah. How deep does she get into the uh, Oh, she, she, she'll call me. She'll be like, why did you spend $6 at the deli? Wow. I'm like, that was just a bottle of Essentia. Why do you need Essentia? That's $6. <laughs> there was one failure that taught you the most. What would it be and what advice would you give to others in order to not repeat it? For the last decade of e-commerce, we've conditioned ourselves as marketers to just immediately offer someone a percentage off or dollars off the gross value of their order. Sure, it helps to capture emails, but it's setting expectations that your brand is a coupon cannon right out of the gate. This is one of the reasons I love Postscript. We know Postscript as the SMS company, but they've launched Cashback, a new Postscript product that allows customers to opt in to getting cash back towards their next purchase instead of just a discount. It can be redeemed as a gift card or store credit where most brands will offer an additional 15 to 25% of credit value. Want new customers to convert better and return? Go to postscript.io slash limited. Okay, Nick, here we go. We're uh, on for the last episode of season seven. This is this season has lasted forever. It's taken so long. It's so did we, long. I think what we did is we started, we batched the first few episodes together, I think. And I think that's why, because we, we started that before the season actually started. Whenever we do that, the season feels so long. This, this is longer than it took me to run native, actually. <laughs> like, that's how long the season has been. Yeah. But okay, this, uh, I, there, are, there are a lot of things to talk about. I want to talk about them in the next episode. I want to talk a lot about the death of aggregators. Like yes. you know, We talked a little bit about Thrasio and how it didn't go right for the guys who started Thrasio. Um, I l- looked into their bankruptcy documents. It was a little interesting. Oh, like, amazing. Um, they were try- in August 2023, they were trying to raise money, and uh, they had two people come to the table, uh, but neither of them would uh, was ultimately ready to sign a deal. They like The two guys at the table were like, look, we'll invest equity in this business, but your debt holders have to take a significant haircut in terms of how much they've loaned you. Like, you know, the loan was $400 million, Now they have to write it off to $100 million. Something wow. like that. Those weren't the exact amounts. What type of people are coming to the table and offering money at, at, to Thrasio for that? Well, I think a lot of people would because you're sort of like, oh, look, I'm going to come in. I'm going to give you, four, let's say I'll give you $500 million. Your yeah. debt your debt that was 500 is now worth 100. All the other in- investors that own 80% of the business, now they own 10% of the business or 20% of the business. Mm-hmm. So you can come in and say, look, uh, it's basically like a bankruptcy, almost like a bankruptcy. Your debt holders take a significant haircut. Your existing equity holders take a significant haircut. I come in with new equity and take majority control. But the debt holders were unwilling to do that in their instance. And they ultimately had a $25 million line of oh, like debt due in September 2023. They got yeah. a forbearance agreement. They went bankrupt. Anyway, well, wow. I want to talk about Thrasio, uh, Wind Brands. Uh, I don't know if you saw this article where Wind Brands did their third round of layoffs recently. They now have 45 employees left. Wow. I didn't know that they were founded as an extension of BV Excel. Did you know that? Um, I knew that there was some crossover, but I didn't know okay. that they were that closely related. Okay, gotcha. And then Razor ended up buying Perch. Do you know Perch? I've heard of Perch, yeah. Uh, you know, they, uh, anyway, Razor ended up buying Perch. And so the next episode, I really want to talk about the death of these uh, aggregators and who's still succeeding, because I think there's still some guys doing well. Totally. But like what went wrong with the aggregators and like things that people can do to avoid or uh, things that people can avoid in order to build better businesses. Because I think one of the things that they did was build a poor business on business fundamentals. And I think a lot of people can learn from that. Yep. But anyway, that's for next episode, season eight, episode one, where hopefully we get a six to, six to 12 year hiatus. <laughs> <laughs> this uh, this episode here, we're chatting about, we're doing a Q&A uh, that came from our Slack group. Is that right? Correct. So we have our Slack channel, limitedsupplypod.com to join. And uh, we asked everybody, what do you want to hear for Q&A? I think last season we did this too to finish out the season. So yeah, it feels right to do I really it again. like these episodes. Yeah, I love it too. It's yeah. just fun discussion and you know, no pressure on us to prepare anything. Yeah, either. that's right. And it's like such actionable feedback. Yeah, like exactly. People it's are all actually tactical. like, there's at least one guy in the world who's wondering what the answer to this is. Exactly. Uh, so let me start. I'm going to start because the first question is teed up specifically for you, or it should be at least. And it's by some guy named Prudence, which is a great name. Um, what is the best landing page structure you see 
current working best? Let me rephrase that. What's the best landing page structure you see working right now? So, um, I mean, it's kind of tough to say the exact like section for section structure, yeah. but you know, the main things you want to, you really want to just answer five or four or five questions over and over again. What's the product? Why does it exist? How's it going to benefit me? If I order today, when does it get here? And how does it compare to the competition? And basically all the other sections that you have, whether it's the hero section, the brag bar, the reviews, the comparison chart, the shop section, all these sections in that order, if you just keep answering those five questions, you've pretty much got a landing page that'll work. I'm, I, I prefer to have longer landing pages over short ones because I feel like if somebody's going to find the answer, they'll click and they'll finish their journey. But if they haven't found the answer, you can keep going. Um, but, you know, if I were to think of uh, if we were selling hint water, I would yeah. say, you know, you put a hero there, add some social proof, have a good angle in the hero from a messaging standpoint. Then you have some social proof below that, like reviews or testimonials or, uh, you know, press logos. Uh, you can get into what makes the product different, or you can sort of tee up the problem. I like to call this the why section. So, uh, you know, why does this product exist? Why does the brand, why did the brand get created? What problem does it solve? That way, then when you get to the actual shop section, you have the problem in mind. What um, are some of the angles that you used at Hint? Um, tons. I mean, they're, you know, like the, you know, one way to sell a product is like, hey, this is flavored water and it tastes really good. And there's zero sugar, zero sweetener which is what, how most people advertise. But the way that we would go about it is, you know, are you a mom that, you know, wants to give, you know, you, you're a mom that wants to give your kid something better than juice, you know, less sugar. That's a that's a, an example of a good angle. Or, um, you know, we had, our biggest angle was always against diet soda. So like actually in general, flavored beverages or sparkling water, their biggest competitor is always diet soda. It's not really other sparkling waters. Really? Yeah. At least that's how I always thought. And it's thought not of it. water either. It's like yeah. LaCroix, you just decide whether you're going to drink Diet Coke or LaCroix. Yeah. Not water. That's fair because you go to the refrigerator. You're not going to the refrigerator for liquid Plain death water. At the time. Yeah. 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 You know. Um, so, anyways, I think the, the biggest thing of the landing page that most people don't do is the angle. Yeah. Um, if you want the full section for section, I think uh, nick.co slash cookbook, you get the whole landing page cookbook. Oh, that's good. Cookbook yeah. is good. Um, what is the one where, you're, like, okay, so yes, obviously image and add to cart are the yeah. most clear. I've, I feel like I've seen a lot of landing pages without that comparison chart. Like last yeah. week we had on, um, you know, Alex from Postscript. Right. And one of the things I talked to him about uh, is I was like, your Postscript landing page, your Postscript homepage doesn't have doesn't show me how you differentiate yourselves between Clavio and Attentive and all the other guys doing SMS. Yeah. That is something that's very common on Amazon pages. Like on Amazon, if you scroll down to the bottom, like you'll often see a comparison chart. Is that necessary? Or like, you know, I guess if that's if let, let me ask you, is that necessary? And then I would ask, what's the one thing where sometimes they don't have it and you don't catch it? Like I feel like social proof, you'd mm -hmm. always catch. You'd be like, wow, there's no reviews. There's nobody saying this is good. Yeah. I feel like that's something I always catch. What's something you don't always catch, but some, uh, but you think is part of good landing page design? Yeah. So on the first question, the comparison chart, I think there's a few different ways to do the comparison chart. So if you are, uh, let's take Postscript for an example. Yeah. Um, you know, Postscript could compare themselves to other platforms, you know, showing the, the purpose of SMS. So SMS versus the benefits of just doing email or yep. direct mail or, you know, partner marketing, yes. whatever it is. They could also compare themselves to direct competitors. So they could say attentive, Clavio, yep. Sendlane. And those would be two completely different pieces of comparison charts. Um, the third would be, which I think is more applicable to a CPG product. Let's say you're selling, um, you know, protein powder. Yeah. Uh, you might compare, you know, something like a high-end protein powder, a plant-based protein powder, and like a, you know, beef, yeah. beef made protein yeah. powder. Um, so you could, you could do it in a way that's not, you're not calling out competitors, but you're still giving the customer a good understanding. Really. The point is that, um, you, you're, you have one of the pieces in the comparison chart is something that the customer knows well. And so it acts as a point of reference to then show how is your product product better or worse in certain ways. Okay. Um, your second question of what's something that's not always in there, but when it's in there, it's really good. When it's not in there, it doesn't necessarily hurt it. Yeah. Is um is like a four reasons why or a five reasons why about sixty percent of the way through a landing page. Okay. You know, if somebody's gotten to sixty percent, they're still looking for answers. Yeah. And if you can reverse engineer what people talk about in their reviews into a five reasons why listicle, yeah. starting with the most, you know, like Caraway's uh most talked about features is like nonstick or easy to clean or 
uh, their storage. And so if you make that listicle and the first one is nonstick, the second one's easy to clean, the third one is easy to store, you know, you're basically just reverse engineering what the customers have already told you they value out of the product the yeah. most. Yeah, yeah, okay. Gotcha. Um, so that's I think really that's one that people can yeah. add. Do you use caraway pots and pans? Uh, you yeah. Cook? Okay. Yeah. I, uh, I, yeah, I don't really cook that much. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. What about like, um, you know, uh, like those FOMO, like there's a couple apps sometimes that I see that I find really interesting. One is like that Tolstoy app where you look at the bottom right and it's like a video of the founder saying, hey, how are you? Uh, like, welcome to our brand and come check us out. I think I saw this recently on a brand called Wonder Mondays, which does, I think I saw it on there, which does like a high protein, um, low carb, yeah, uh, low carb cheesecake. Uh, and I thought that was really interesting that like, here's the CEO talking about it at the bottom right. Uh, you know, sometimes you see those things that say Nick just bought from one, two minutes ago from New York, New York, you know, John just bought from five minutes ago from Omaha, Nebraska. Um, you know, and like, you know, there used to be one where I, I'm not sure if this still exists where you could do like stories, like, you know, you're basically your mobile page would have story reviews at the very top that people yeah. format people were really used to through Instagram. Do have you tried any of those? Are those good? Are those like, how do you think about using that type of software? Yeah. So we, I'm a huge fan of Tolstoy. I, um, I haven't personally implemented it, but yeah. everybody who I know has put it on has said that it has definitely helped increase conversion. Okay. And I think it works really well for brands that are not super well known and also have a good, you know, publicly facing founder. Yeah. I think that helps a lot. Um, there is an app we've used in the past called Livecom, L Y V E C O M which does what you're sort of talking about, which is like, how do you demonstrate either UGC or yeah, um, yeah, more yep. story style content? Yeah. This has helped on a few landing pages we've made for um, Glamnetic and there was one other brand specifically, but uh, yeah, I mean, it looks beautiful. It, it arranges quickly, it, it loads quickly. You get some better analytics specific to the video yeah. that you don't normally get if you just use YouTube shorts or Vimeo. Um, mm. but if you're not going to use Livecom, I'd recommend using YouTube shorts because Vimeo gets expensive quick. Really? Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. But if you put it in YouTube shorts and you just embed the shorts. It's and, free. Yeah, it's free. Wow. God. But like when you're doing YouTube shorts like that, is there, is there any chance an ad runs at the beginning or no? No. Okay. Yeah. It's a good question though. I actually, I'm not a hundred thousand percent confident yeah. in that, but yeah. I'm pretty sure. It'd be crazy if they that did, would be right? crazy. Like, you, you just got a native's website. You're like, I want to watch this influencer yeah. use a product. And the first thing you get is an ad for a secret deodorant. Yeah, exactly. That would be absolutely be nuts. bananas. Okay. Let me move on to question. T I, I think that was a great answer. Uh, I'm always like impressed and in awe of all these new brands or all these like new software services that help improve conversion. Yeah. I'm often a little skeptical as well. Same. And like, you know, it's almost always a trade-off. Like, yeah. yeah, you can add Tolstoy, but then you got to get rid of your live chat because you can't have a live chat and Tolstoy. Yeah. Or you got to get rid of your, like, you know, your Clavio or Postscript or Attentive. Like, you know, the like the thing that when you when it, when you close the uh, pop-up and it sort of goes away into that little bubble. Yeah. You know, you can't have, uh, like I've gone on some of these landing pages and I'm like, there's seven bubbles here. <laughs> yeah. It feels like I'm being attacked <laughs> yeah. by bubbles. I even get annoyed when you just see like the get 10% off button. Yeah, yeah. You know, that's and you what click I mean, yeah. it and it just tricks you into the email pop-up. Yeah, yeah. That's, it's just a terrible experience. That's what they all do. But yeah. I'm saying like, if you have that uh, live chat and Tolstoy yeah, and FOMO, you're just like, what's going on? Like, you know, you got to make sure that your landing page still looks clean as well. Yeah. And like represents the brand. I think there is that trade off. So like when you use Tolstoy, yeah, it might be all great when it comes to ROI, but you're probably sacrificing ROI because you're yeah. giving up something else there. Yeah. It's also worth calling out like the reason we, I mean, that is really the reason we never really talk much about software companies on this podcast, nor do we promote anything we don't use because there are so many things out there that have all, all these outrageous claims. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think we've we talked about a few and gotten a little, uh, you know, it's gotten a little, we get some heat. Us. We got yeah. a couple cease and desist. Yeah. What do you think about like, um, well, well, let's move on to question two right. actually. Um, okay. It's the last episode of the season. I feel like yeah, I'm, yeah. I don't need to like throw bombs out <laughs> today. today. <laughs> it's also Ramadan. So I'm like, okay, I'm fasting. No bombs today. <laughs> uh, where do either of you guys spend your time on a daily basis? Would love to learn more about what it's like to be an agency owner, a CEO, all, operating multiple businesses, or an investor. Uh, where do you spend your time, actually? I feel like you should go first. I'm so curious about this too. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm a little curious as well. Uh, the honest answer is that there's virtually no day that's the same as another day. 
uh, which is um, weird, but also they're all packed is the worst part about it. Like I, I will carve out like two hours in the middle of the day to go to the gym mm-hmm. um, and, and I'll do that religiously. I'm like, okay, it's 11 a.m. or t- uh, you know noon. I'm gonna go to the gym. And that's uh, like, I, I, I hold those two hours uh, on a daily basis because I really enjoy them. But you know, today um, I like was bidding on a house auction um, and it didn't work out. And uh, but I, I like diligence to other house auctions that I'm looking at. So I'm like, okay, I'm gonna go. You know, uh, there's auctions coming up over the course of the next week. Yeah. I'll calendar them. I'll do a little bit of diligence, and then I'll be, you know, if I've got a guy on the ground, I'll be like, hey, you go check this house out. Send me photos, and you get back to me about what it looks like. Um, so, you know, that's a little bit of my day. Um, I'll look at an e-commerce brand earlier this week. I made an offer for an e-commerce brand. Um, and, uh, you know, I have no idea if it'll be like, I think it was a really compelling offer. Um, I offered a multiple that exceeds most multiples today. Um, and you know, I was also like, look, we can close this deal whenever you like, you know, you can close in a week if you want to close in a week or 30 days, if you want to close in 30 days. And, um, you know, I'm not uh, like, I'm not trying to reach, you know, if your numbers are right, I'm not trying to retrade. I like, mm-hmm. I don't care about, you, you know, I want to, I want to do deals. Um, so I did that earlier this week. Um, I had a couple like, you know, people were at Expo West. So I wanted to introduce a few people that I knew at Expo West to other people that I thought would be interesting. Um, and so I did that as well. Um, and then I had, you know, random phone calls with companies that I'm thinking about investing in or an advisor in, or like, you know, uh, I had dinner with a guy who's in e-commerce, um, Two night or like what? What's today? Friday? Uh, Thursday? Shoot, no, I don't know. No, it was, oh, uh, you know, it was Wednesday. Like, you know, it'll be random stuff. Yeah. Uh, or somebody will be in town to talk about e-commerce. Or I'll have a board. Like, you know, I think this last week for one entire day, I had a board meeting. And like, you know, the night before you get the board deck, so you're probably up pretty late reviewing the board deck before you get into the board meeting. Um, sometimes I'll do calls for a company that I'm invested in and they're like, Hey, we're trying to re- hire this guy. Can you call him up and tell him to uh, take this job? Yeah. Um, I've done that for postscript in the past cause I'm an investor in postscript. Uh, so they're all pretty random days. You know, I've all, I'm also an investor or advisor in a bunch of businesses or own a business. And so we'll do a board call or like, you know, we'll go through the monthly pr- performance of that business Yeah. and we'll see, you know, what's your, wh- what does EBITDA look like? Where are things trending? Uh, can I be helpful in any way? Are we trying to launch into Target? Are we trying to launch into on a platform where I have a relationship with the CEO? Can I help in that way? Uh, so that I'll also get involved in that. And uh, like that happens quite frequently. Yeah. And so even when I travel, I'm like constantly making sure that I'm like, not for personal gain, but but like, you know, it's just so I can not like not to leverage a relationship, but so I can be helpful for other people. I'll be talking to people a bunch. Yeah. I feel like both you and I do that a lot where we connect other to yeah, other people definitely. with obviously no expectation in return, yeah, yeah. but just being attached to, you know, like introducing two people and they do something great. Just being attached to that is all, all the satisfaction. Yeah. Yeah. And like the nice part is when I don't know someone in e-commerce, I know that I can text you or like, yeah. you know, and I hope that like, likewise, where I'm yeah. like, okay, this, you know, I'm like, you can make the introduction right away. Totally. Um, and yeah, like I will, I've never taken an affiliate fee on an introduction. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of SaaS companies I'm an investor in and they're like, you know, I think triple will once sent me $70 cause they said, you got this customer for us. And I was like, <laughs> you know, I don't, first it's $70 and second, yeah. I was like, I don't like how this feels. Yeah. And so I emailed the guy and I was like, look, I got $70. I'll donate it to charity or give it to you. You tell me what you want to do. Yeah. They've, uh, I, that's happened with one other SaaS platform. I forgot what it was. No one has ever been like, send me the money. Everyone has always been like, just donate, donate to charity. It. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, my days are are pretty up and down or not up and down, but pretty random as well. Um, you know, if I'm traveling, the schedule tends to be different. It's usually focused around trying to set up meetings or, you know, lunches, dinners, yeah, coffee sure. meetings, what workout do you do meetings. When you're not traveling. How does this work? Like, how does your agency work? Are you doing sales calls? Are you doing like... Yeah. So like this week, for example, I was not traveling. Um, you know, I'd say half my week is probably meetings, calls with either existing clients, internal meetings, you know, sitting in with our team and figuring out what we're doing for certain clients or how we're going to do something cool. How do you like manage those clients? Cause like, I don't know how many clients you guys have, but you know, uh, traditionally an agent, like if I'm, if I'm working with an agency, I don't want my account rep to have more than four clients. You're not an account rep by any stretch of the imagination, but like, oh, how involved are you on any given brand? I'd say I'm pretty involved in the strategy piece and seeing everything before it goes out. So I see all the final designs, all the final creative, um, wow. and all the final media plans. I'm not in every single client meeting day to day because then I wouldn't have any time. Yeah. 
but um, I sit with the team every week. We go through, okay, from a strategy standpoint, you know, this client, they're coming up 3% short on their monthly goal. What are we doing in order to fix that? You know, are we going to run a flash sale? Are we going to do this? Are we going to do that? Um, you know, we've had with the, with Facebook these last couple of weeks, it's been a total shit show. And so a lot of my energy has been focused around how do we find the right people at Facebook that can yeah. actually get us answers and get these problems fixed. Yeah. Um, basically it's like, um, you know, my, uh, COO, now we have a COO, um, she pretty much dictates like where I spend my time. So every Monday she'll tell me, here's where, here's what you need to do this week. And it's in notion. And then my only job is to focus on that. It might be like three things or four things that need to get done. Um, and then my entire focus is that. How do you manage the finances at your firm? Who's doing that? Is there a CFO? Um, my mom's our CFO. Your mom is yeah. your CFO. So we have wow. somebody who collects receivables. Oh, you better be very careful about her. Oh, trust me. <laughs> I, have to, I have to make sure every charge is valid. Yeah. Is, and uh, so I'm sorry. So she's your CFO. She goes through all the charges. She goes through all the charges. She itemizes everything. She, she's doing all our taxes right now. Bless her heart. Yeah. Um, you know, in Wolf of Wall Street, the CFO is the fa- like uh, Jordan Belfort's father. Yeah. And then Jordan Belfort's like, what was this $26,000 you spent last night? And, the, uh, you know, they're like, oh, we had to take a, the, a Pfizer out to dinner and they ordered all the si- like the, we went to the steakhouse and they ordered all the sides. And, you know, Jonah Hill's like, yeah, we got all these sides. And the guy, the father's like, $26,000 in sides. This is a strip club. <laughs> and I know it's a strip club. Yeah. Uh, you know, is your mom look like how deep does she get into the. Uh, oh, she, the she, <laughs> she, she'll call me. She'll be like, why did you spend $6 at the deli? Wow. I'm like, well, that was just a bottle of Essentia. Why do you need Essentia? That's $6. <laughs> She's pretty that's strict. Yeah, yeah, but we awesome. both get, uh, yeah, we both get alerts for pretty much every charge that happens. Wow. Okay. So. Um, and then yeah. like, how do you manage the, like, okay. So what do you do with the cash that's at the company? Cause I, that's the one other thing is like, um, you know, I, I spend a bunch of time. I was thinking about this while you're talking. Uh, yeah. I also want to go back to Facebook ads being a shit yeah. show. Uh, I was like, I spend a bunch of time doing cash management, mm-hmm. which is like, um, this bond has matured. Uh, you know, where does this money go? Like this week I had a loan out to Mm-hmm. And it was for three hundred fifty thousand dollars that I got back. Uh, you know, uh, I don't know yesterday. Mm-hmm. So I had to like make sure that the wire was the right amount. And then I'm like, okay, I'm now sitting on three hundred fifty thousand dollars in cash. What the hell am I supposed to do with this? Like, does this go in a bond? Does this go in face? Uh, f- uh, like, you know, Facebook stuff. Like, I'm sort of making those decisions. Yeah, with absolutely no intel, like n- in a non intelligent way. And that's not- still better than a wealth plan. That's far better than a wealth <laughs> manager. That's far better than a wealth manager. Um. Yeah, you know, how do you manage that kind of stuff? Well, uh, I mean, the credit goes to you, but I we just put it in treasuries. Okay, uh, so it just sits, and I call it farming. It goes out and just farms. Yeah, 5%. that's right. But like, then where, uh, you know, where does it go? Does it go in three month, six month, nine month, two year, ten year treasuries? It's like, tre- treasuries have whatever the default is in the banking app. Okay. Um, okay. Let's so, go yeah. over whatever the default yeah. At some is point, we got to go through all this because um, you know the default can be so like you know a year ago or like three months ago the ten year treasuries were yielding. Uh, 5%, more than 5%. Now, mm-hmm. then they were yielding 3.9%. Now it's 4.3. Uh, so you want to like make sure that you, there's still a little bit of a game to be played in terms of duration. Yeah. Uh, but, so we'll go over that uh, uh, offline. Cool. Want to do SMS the right way? You have to go with PostScript. If you care about maximizing the amount of revenue you generate on SMS, and that is your North Star metric, you've got to pick PostScript. They're dedicated to this channel, and if you want to be as good at SMS as possible for your brand, they're really the only option. Over 13,000 Shopify merchants swear by PostScript. Graza, True Classic, Feastables, Brooklinen, Ruggable, Jones Road Beauty, My Old Brand Native, the list goes on and on. Learn more at postscript.io slash limited. Okay, yo, Facebook ads have been a shit show for the last two weeks for you guys. Oh my God, what a shit show. There was the bug. Yeah. And then, um, and a couple accounts were completely unaffected, but a handful of them totally were affected and they were, they were affected in different ways. Some would have issues with the payment just wouldn't be accepted. Like the credit card wouldn't charge then. Uh, and it kept showing like an internal, uh, uh platform error. Then another one would be, uh, for, you know, hours in the day, no spend for no reason, no message, you know, nothing there for others. It was like CPM was completely inflated. Um, so anyways, like in that situation, for example, my best use would be to go find who is the most senior person that can help us quickly. Yeah. Um, 
because you know most most uh yeah most people can't really do much there yeah um okay yeah that makes sense uh, and so did you see mostly like administrative issues like yeah i can't sign in or did you see mostly serious issues of like spend is fucked yeah it was more like serious issues okay. on the facebook side yeah 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 um, and like, that's still continuing. It's not, it's not an administrative issue. There's like an issue where people are like, what's going on? My performance is really crappy. <clears throat> yeah. It's getting better. I think like it's slowly getting better, but yeah. it's still not fully fixed. Yeah. That's really interesting. Um, yeah. okay. And then, um, yeah, you know what I found is that I, I forgot who, who tweeted this. Somebody tweeted a while ago. They're like, I got a call off of my Facebook. I got a, you know, I got off of a call with my Facebook rep and it was a complete waste of time. Mm. And, um, those are those meta marketing people that, that email you. Yeah. The, the, like they said in Austin, they're SMB yeah. guys. And, you know, I found that like, I found Pint both with Pinterest and with Facebook in my career, I've had terrible reps and great reps. Yeah. And you really have to like, like even terrible, like terrible reps are really hard because you, there's probably no value you can extract from them. Um, I remember I had a call once and the guy was like, uh, you know, I was running native and the guy was like, um, how do you guys make money at this company? And I was like, how do you get, generate revenue? Yes. And I said, sir, I don't, I like, uh, uh, you know, I'm now dumber, uh, because <laughs> of you. And then I remember he was like reading this list and he's like, okay, I'm not going to ask this question. And I was like, you don't need to say out loud that you're not going to read a que like a question off of the list. But anyway, like, so I do think there are reps that are particularly difficult to be work with because mm -hmm. they just don't know the, e the ecosystem or like what's going on in the world. Then there are reps that are exceptional that everyone wants. And there are reps in the middle somewhere too. Yeah. But even if the reps in the middle somewhere, I feel like there's so much value to be extracted, like so much value they can have. What are promotions that are coming up? Are you hearing from your other brands that they are seeing higher CPMs or is that really not a, like, you know, people are here feeling higher CPMs. They're probably going to tell their Facebook ad rep, you know, I'm feeling higher CPMs. Is that true? Yeah. Um, you know, are, is conversion rate going down? What is the next thing that, what are the things that your, uh, you know, your management is continuing to harp on mm -hmm. so, because that's what they're like, you know, subsidizing. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, where, where, like, you know, how, what does my saturation look like? Can you run a, a like, can you look, look on your end and look at what my audience saturation looks like? Like, I think that a lot of times with Facebook, people are like, oh, my rep is really garbage. And yep. like, you're, most reps are not garbage. Yep. There are 1% of people that like just graduated college that don't know what e-commerce is, barely know what Facebook is, and somehow got a job there. And like, they're not well-trained and like, you're not gonna get a lot of value from them. There are exceptional reps where they will provide the value upfront on their own. And there are reps in the middle where it's your job to come in prepared and to be like, you know, I'm seeing these issues with Facebook. Other other companies that are spending, of you know, you're you're managing ten accounts. Are people spending more? Are their budgets growing from last year or last quarter or last month? Or are they going down? You don't need to name names, but tell me how other people are trending because that's probably a good indication of how I should be trending too. Yeah, definitely growing. Um, and the ones that are growing too are the ones that, um, like, our brands that do the best on Facebook are brands that really put an emphasis on content and yeah. creative, and. Um, like they care less about the whole funnel. They care more about, okay, do we have the best piece of content? Like, is this content that's going to make people, you know, is it bright and colorful and flashy and interesting? Um, but yeah, I would say Facebook spend is still up. One thing on your reps point though, I completely agree. Like there, you know, most of the reps that uh, reach out, if they cold reach out to you, that's not a real Facebook rep. That's contracted from an outside company. And they're generally looking for uh, to just get on the phone with you and see how they can get you to spend a little bit more. Then there's the reps that are generally based in either Mountain View or Austin. And those are like the SMB reps. Yeah. Those guys are hugely helpful because yeah. even though they're not, you know, they can't move mountains maybe, but like everything you were mentioning, the saturation reports, you know, CPMs, uh, platform issues, like those are things that you could extract from them. And I also just think a lot of people don't really put uh, effort into building a relationship with a Facebook rep. They only hit them up when they need help, um, Definitely, yeah. which doesn't help them when they yeah. need help. And then the best reps are obviously the disruptor teams in Mountain View and um, and New York. Those guys can make anything happen and they uh, they can move the quickest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What is the value that the disruptor team offers? Like I've never had a disruptor rep. What yeah. is the value that they get? Um, that you get from them? My opinion would be that you get access to alphas and betas before anybody else. You get access to be a part of case studies, which means that, you know, let's say um, 
you know, let's say, uh, I don't know that this is true, but like Nostra, for example, has a bunch of Facebook case studies. Um, I know Google does this, so I'll say this for Google, but like, let's say uh, Google, you know, Google comes to Sharma Brands says, hey, Sharma Brands, we want to buy 50 landing pages. If you're in that disruptors group of at Google, which they call it something different, you'll get the landing page for free and Google will pay for it and then Sharma Brands will make it. And so you get sort like little advantages wow. here and there where you can save anywhere from, I don't know, five to a hundred thousand dollars, maybe a quarter in opportunities. And then you obviously get just tier one support, you know, the disruptor reps too, like the average, uh, I think SMB rep has anywhere from, I actually, I don't know the number, but it's a lot of clients. Yeah, yeah It's yeah. more than 25, I think per person, whereas the disruptors reps, I think is less than. 10, maybe less than five. Wow. So you just get a lot more dedicated support. They're proactively looking at what you can yeah. be doing better. And I think they're also compensated based on quarter over quarter spend growth. So they're really looking to figure out to how you can grow your account okay, and grow gotcha. your brand. That's really interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's interesting that like reps can have 25 different accounts, like, you know, SMBs, yeah. and like they can vary so much. <clears throat> I recently had a conversation with a rep and I was like, what is your, like, you know, what are you managing? And they're like, we have one guy who spends $1.5 million a month and one guy who spends, you know, $80,000 a month. Yeah. And I'm like the same person. It's tough because like, like even that. the strategies there are two completely yes, different exactly, worlds of strategy. Exactly. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why I think it's, it's that that's a really hard job. That can be a really hard job. Yeah. Um, yeah. I uh, Okay, great. Uh, let's move on. Cool. Uh, okay. Next question is um, from Zoe. Is that Zoe or Zoe, you think? Probably Zo. We'll just go with Zoe. Okay. <laughs> um, if there was one failure that taught you the most, what would it be, and what advice would you give to others in order to not repeat it? Ooh, do you have a good one? Um. Yeah, I think I do, but I I repeated it. <laughs> oh, okay. Um. Yeah, the one I thought would be good, I think, isn't as great, but um. It was, so the original one I was thinking was, was, uh, trusting AI a little bit too much because, you know, AI is not, AI is AI. It's not real human. Uh, but I was specifically thinking of, uh, this landing page or not landing page this heat map, AI, AI heat map tool called Cluify that we used for a little bit. And then I actually dug into the report and I was like, this makes no sense. But then you have to remember, of course, it doesn't make sense because it's a computer sure. trying to act like a human yeah. on a website that hasn't been run with real traffic. Yeah. Um, that was mine. You probably have that's a That's your one. biggest failure. If there's one failure that taught you the most, that's it. Cluify? Uh, I mean, not marrying an Indian yet. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, like the, the first business I ever tried to start was this social location mobile app where we'd go out and like, you know, try and tell you where to go to have fun. And it was a terrible idea. And, but it was like a sexy idea. Mm -hmm. And I hung out with some investor and he's like, don't build, he's like, how I like pitched him the idea. And he's like, how honest do you want me to be? And I was like, brutal. And he was, and he's like, this is a terrible idea. You're never going to make this work. You're never going to get distribution. Uh, you have no idea how hard this is. There's zero chance it works. You know, you're fucked. Mm -hmm. And, uh, that was great advice actually, which was, um, don't try and build anything sexy. Yeah. Um, I think like, you know, like, se you know, sexy businesses, everyone wants to build a sexy business because everyone wants to be a playboy. Mm -hmm. The reality is they never work out. Like, uh, that's so true. You know, it, 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 like Uber might be the one exception that I yeah. can think of. Everything else, like, you know, is less. And sexy. Uber wasn't sexy at all for a long time. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so I think that's a lesson that I've learned. Um, the other lesson I've learned that's super personal to me, and I'm not sure if it's applicable to anybody else, is. Uh, in order to do anything, I need to keep balls in the air. Like yeah. I, I, I can't like start a business by thinking about it and writing on a sheet of paper and then like brainstorming more. I need to start a business right away. And as it's failing, my mind will already be working on the next. Like, right. you know, uh, that it. business failed and we ended up trying to start another sexy business, which was a big mistake. Again, I repeated it, which was a liquor business where we sold hard liquor online. But that and wasn't a failure, though. That wasn't a failure, but it was like, um, you know, there were so many problems with that business. Yeah. And I'm, like, I look back on myself and I'm like, what was I thinking with all yeah. these problems? And then, um, but like, you know, what was helpful was that failure, like, you know, one failure led to, I guess, this next totally. success. Yeah. And the same thing happened with Native. Before Native, I, I wrote this Twitter thread on it once where I, I was trying to start um, kayak for home loans. Like, if you want to get a home loan, it is, one day you might go through the process. It is so painful. 
Like you've got to, especially for you, because you're an entrepreneur. So they're going to yeah. be like, send us your W-2. And you might not have a W-2 because you're an entrepreneur. And they're going to say, you know, send us your a reference letter. And you're going to be like, what? And they're going to say, send us your bank account. And, you know, my bank account went from like zero dollars to few million dollars as a result of my sale of caskers. And then it went to, you know, then there was no income ever again. Like I right. didn't have a job and they're like, what's going on over here. <laughs> and so, um, you know, I was like, let me make, let me automate all of this. You guys like, you know, what should happen is you should just sink into my bank of America account, mm -hmm. pull everything you need. And like, you know, it should be a very easy thing to do. And when interest rates go down, you should automatically give me the new rate. Like, you know, I, like, let's say I'm locked into seven and a half percent rate. Rates dropped to 7% earlier. Does it make sense to refi and just give me the 7% rate? You have access to everything, so I don't need to redo it. Yeah. But, um, you know, no, like, you know, it was so fucking hard to build that business. Yeah. And, but like, you know, starting it made me, post caskers, it made me just move. Right. And like that motion created energy. And that energy ultimately was like, this, uh, you know, this home loan business doesn't work, but, the, uh, you know, maybe I should start this deodorant business. Yeah. And so for me, for me, the greatest l lesson that I've learned in my career is that like, I need motion to make things happen. Yeah. I couldn't agree more. I think, uh, yeah, if you, if you're not doing it, then there's no way you can learn. I think it's the best way to learn too. Like people talk about, uh, Facebook ads courses, there's one or two that are great, but for the most part, you just got to get in there yeah. with a thousand bucks and start figuring out what button does what. Yes. You know? Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. You're not going to go through a course and be like, this is how you, this is the difference between the headline right. and the text. And like, you know, you've got to spend dollars. Yeah, it's like totally. riding a bike. Yeah. You're not going to be able to do it until you get on. Exactly. Um, and yeah, I, I, I agree with you on that Facebook ad stuff. You just got to do it. Totally. Um, okay. Let's move on to this next question by Shri Reddy. I'm going to skip one. This is as a new direct to consumer brand, when should you start optimizing for profit versus product market fit? Is there a per unit margin you want to aim for to start? I'm curious what you think, both as an investor and somebody who owns a handful of brands. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I think of it like, you know, I, I, all of my brands are have product, like, you know, they're not revolutionizing a category, you know, yeah. like, even native, like didn't revel, like it might've revolutionized deodorant that it was natural, but no one was like, why would anyone need deodorant? Right? right. Like everyone knew that they needed that. So generally my brands have that type of product market fit. They don't always have product marketing fit, mm -hmm. which is another behemoth in and of itself, which is how do you make sure that you're marketing in a way that makes sense and you can acquire customers for a reasonable amount? Um, the way I did it at Native, I remember this was like we were paying five dollars and fifty cents for a stick of deodorant, um, and the math barely made sense. Like mm -hmm. you know, we had no money to spend on marketing, but that was okay because I was like, look, if this business works, the economies of scale will start working, and I will obviously not be paying this enormous price for a stick of deodorant at the beginning. Mm -hmm. And I think that's true for probably a lot of categories. Like if you're Jolie shower heads or athletic greens, or a gummy vitamin business, or symbiotica, your, the, your, the unit cost for your first whatever it was, or magic spoon, you know, I bet they have a cheaper price per box of cereal wholesale now, or like, you know, their own cost has gone down, I bet by more than 50% since they launched, you know, totally. because like, before they're like, look, we will make 10,000 because we have to, but if we can do 5,000, let's do that. Now they're like, we need 150,000 of these buddies, baby, right. like, you know, crank it out. Yeah. And so I assume that those economies of scale will hit. And when you're trying to think about margin, just assume that at some point in the next six months, you will get to the economies of scale that are good. You won't get to P&G level, but you'll mm -hmm. get to, or you won't get to probably Kellogg level, but you'll get to Magic Spoon level. And so like, um, see if that margin will work six months. Like, presume that your margin six months from now is your margin today. Will the economics work <clears throat> when you're marketing? That's how I think about it. Yeah, I think that's a great way to think about it. I do think... Um, Profit obviously is like, you know, that's why you start a business. Yeah. But I, I also do think that you got to leave yourself some room to really test and figure things out before yeah. you uh, decide, you know, you're not going to, you're, you're just going to optimize for profit. Yeah. Yeah. You can't do that on day two yeah. of running a brand or even month two of running a brand. There's still totally. so many things you want to How much do you with? think somebody should, uh, you know, if somebody's starting a new business today, yeah. how much should they set aside in order to find that product market fit or product marketing fit? You know, I think that's a tough, uh, I'll tell you how I would think about it if I were in somebody else's shoes is like, you know, again, if I were Jeff Bezos' son, I always give this example. I'd be like, great, I have $40 trillion. Uh, yeah. I, I, I'll spend, how about I spend, you know, $50 million to figure this out. And I think brands have done that. Didn't like Lunia or like there was some like clothing brand that was, you know, there, there've been a bunch of brands that like, I think it was Lunia, wasn't it? That went bankrupt. Yep. 
And uh, they went bankrupt and it turned out they raised $20 million. And you're like, where did you get $20 million? And <laughs> yeah. it's like, my family. Right. And so, you know, then I would probably spend a lot more if $20 million didn't have a lot of value to me. It has enormous amounts of value to me. Yeah. So I think I would be like, look, um, I can spend... I, I can spend $5,000. I, I I agree that I'm going to lose $5,000 no matter what yeah. when I'm starting this business. If my CAC starts at $100 and I can get it down to, I don't know, $75, I'm going to unlock another $5,000. Mm. If I can get the you know $100 down to $50, I'll unlock another $10,000. Yep. And uh, that's how I think about it. Look, if I if I if it's a hundred dollars, I'm sorry. If it's a hundred dollars, I've spent five thousand dollars, and I haven't moved it at all. I haven't learned a single thing. You know, I might still unlock that other five thousand dollars, but I might be like, look, this isn't working, right? Because like it's I'm not, not going to spend ten thousand dollars of my income, having spent you know a, 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 when I was making eighty thousand dollars a year. You know, which means fifty thousand dollars a year post tax. I just spent twenty percent of my year. Yeah. You know, on this uh, these Facebook ads, and they didn't go anywhere. Like yep. I didn't. Like I might have learned something, but I wasn't able to reduce my CAC, and that's tough. Totally. And so I think that's the thing where I do where I'm like, okay, am I seeing things going in the right direction? That unlocks me spending more money. Yeah. Am I not seeing things, uh, you know, going in the right direction? That closes off, and that that goes later on too. Like with tell, you know, when you're big and you're starting to spend on television ads. And you're like, okay, great. I'll spend off. I'll spend fifty thousand or a hundred thousand dollars right, for a test. With uh, w- for a test, if I see, you know, if nothing is getting better, if I went from a hundred dollars to one hundred twenty-three dollars, see you later, television. Yep. Like you know, um, but if it went from a hundred dollars to fifty dollars, great. I'm ready to spend another two hundred fifty k. Totally. Yeah, I love that answer. Um, okay, should we do one more then? Let's or, do it. Okay, great. Um, let's see. What's another good one? Ooh. Okay, let's do this one. If there's a, uh, is there a better way to find suppliers and materials for product development? For example, Ooh. a list or a resource that is specific to the industry or good. If deodorant go to X for apparel, go to Y. Sarang Patel. I, I feel like um, the best, and I should also preface by saying that, you know, I'm not usually on this side. I'm mostly on the agency side. But uh from my limited experience, it's always been introdu- introductions from other people who've uh, cool. either done it before or been familiar. Like you introduced me to Mary Berry. Yeah. Um, you know, I have another friend who ended up starting to do packaging work. So we use him for packaging work. Um, is this, is Nick Kwan? No. Okay. Uh, but I love him too. Works. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Package <laughs> works is great. That, yeah. um, no, this is like a components basically. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. Um, but yeah, I've always found that like warm intros from people who you know have had good experiences, and this goes even for 3PLs, for agencies, I think in general, I think if you, you know, the the alternative way, I think that this person is thinking about is like a import Yeti type of search engine, yeah. um, which, or Alibaba, which, you know, you can definitely do and go find great samples and products, but I think it's always better to get a warm intro or like somebody else that I'll always hit up if I need something sourcing wise is Jeremy Kai, who owns Italic. Because he knows every factory in China and what they can do, and oh, that's interesting. he uh, he's made almost every product under the sun. Wow! Yeah, <laughs> um, that is a great. I, I agree with that answer, which is um, intros are the right way to do this uh, for a couple reasons. One is, you know, you're gonna you're gonna trust this person more because uh, somebody that you know somebody you know referred them. And uh, they're going to work harder for you because they understand that their reputation is at stake, not just with you, but with the person that made the introduction. And like I've made introductions to Mary, for instance, and those went side. Like you know, the, mm-hmm. uh, ultimately the relationship didn't work out, and like I, I like I feel bad for having made that introduction because I'm like you know I put my uh, neck on the yeah, line. Yeah, you put your this. reputation on the yeah. line. Yeah, and so uh, when you don't, when you're not like a good actor, that's going to be the last intro I'll ever make to you. Totally. Um, and so I feel like that, uh, so yeah, I think that like, you know, there's reputation on both sides of it for the person yeah. who's made the introduction. And so, uh, I think those are super valuable. Um, there is no good, you know, import Yeti is a great one for like, is, who's importing what from China and right. like, what are they, uh, like, like, what are they importing and what quantities are they even importing in some ways as well? Yeah. Um, and I think that is a really good one. And, you know, with Chinese suppliers, it's the hardest because you're sort of sending out a wire to China to a bank that you'll never hear, you've never heard of <laughs> yeah. and you'll never hear of again. And, you know, you don't even be- like, you know, the name of the bank does not fit in the account, like exceeds the account, the characters that you can write in account title. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's because it's a weird name and or like a different name, I should say. And so um, I think, yeah, warm intros are the only way to do this. There are not good um, resources out there, unfortunately. 
Uh, what I would say is I would always ask for references as well. And then I would try and get my, like, not just those references, but I'd try and get my own references, mm. whether it be through Twitter or friends. Like if you're working with a new 3PL, you want to find out, hey, who is that 3PL? Uh, and what are other people, uh, what have other experiences been like with that 3PL? Right. And if you just get references, those references are always going to be positive. You want negative reference. You want somebody who's churned. Right. And the, uh, like, if you find somebody who's churned, you can find out, hey, look, how was this 3PL on my way out? Yep. Did they uh, fuck up all my stuff? Um, how was this 3PL when I had a billing issue? Right. And, um, you know, I've had a lot of 3PL issues in my career. And Really? You know, I yeah, I've never had a guessed. lot of three PL issues, <laughs> and I'm like, you know, I it like three uh, PL issues make like you know are a, ca- a call to war. When someone talks yeah. about a three PL, and particular the one I'm thinking about now, and they're like, "Hey, what do you think of them?" I'm like, "I will if you are raising an army to fight that three PL. Count me in." Yeah, and I don't need a gun. Give me a stick. I will sharpen it, and I will go stab people myself over there <laughs> because I am fucking irate. Yeah, and you know I will make call, like you know uh, you know I get a call you know people will uh, be like hey I think this guy's using a three PL. Yeah, and I will I will reach out to them on LinkedIn or Twitter or whatever it is, and I'll be like hey let's get on the phone. I want to I've had a bad experience with this random guy in Colorado. Let's chat. Yeah, I've had a bad experience with this random guy in Oklahoma. Let's get on a phone because you should not be using that person. Yeah. But, and this is the opposite of an affiliate fee. You don't earn money by, you the know. D-filiate. Yeah, D-filiate. That's right. Yeah. I don't get a D-filiate fee, but I do get satisfaction in making sure that person who's a bad actor in the industry does not get more business. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, somebody's got to do it. Yeah. 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 It's the problem my, is there's too many people pleasure. shilling it's on the internet. It's my pleasure. Uh, so this that. is the counter to the shilling. That's right. Yeah. Uh, that, there is a lot of shilling on Twitter. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. So are there any other resources? Import Yeti was a great one. Is there anything else you use like that or not really? Um, not really. I think yeah. Import Yeti, you know, there was one point where I wanted to make the, the best, most comfortable pillow yeah. and I didn't know where to start. And uh, I basically went to Alibaba and I ordered like 25 samples and I just paid each sample was like 75 bucks for the product and yeah. shipping. Um, and I thought that was pretty efficient too. Just like going on there, learning about what type of textile factory it is, getting the product sample and then trying it out. Yeah. Yeah. That's super effective. Yeah. In fact, um, you know, I would say that about Etsy, like we made our deodorant on Etsy Yeah, and we did that by like, you know, looking at a bunch of other deodorants on Etsy and being like, who has good reviews here? Yeah. And that's going to be my private label supplier. Yeah. And I've suggested other people who are doing like, uh, other categories also do that. Like if you're looking to make a, a, a business that's selling 200 units and you want to test it out with 200 units, Etsy is a fantastic place. Yeah. They have reviews. So you can find out like, do people like this product or do they not like it? You know, uh, you, you, you know, the guy's legitimate because he's been selling it. Like, I think that's a fantastic underutilized resource in this instance. Yeah. I, I, I do think like if, if I were thinking, if I was the one who asked this question, my mindset is probably what's the silver bullet that's going to do it. And I think the answer is like you said earlier, just go out, just start emailing factories, go to Alibaba, make an account, start messaging factories, set up a WeChat account or a WhatsApp on your phone, start messaging these people. And uh, also like the best way to like learn how to do this is just do it. Like you'll learn, oh, okay, maybe I should be using PayPal instead of a wire because if something doesn't happen, PayPal's got my back. Yeah. Or, you know, maybe it is worth paying 3% on top of the bill so I can use my Amex. And that way, if nothing works, I get a refund. That's exact. Oh, oh yes. Both of those are yeah. definitely things that I've done. And like, you know, if you can go fly out there, maybe China's inaccessible, but yeah. the guys in- Actually, you know who's out there and always has an open invite is Roman from Peak 21. Yeah. If he always says like, anybody can come work at the office and go look at the factories. Yeah, that's awesome. He's yeah. in Hong Kong and yeah. in Shenzhen, which is where you need to be. But you know, yeah. go to like, look, you don't need to go to Shenzhen. A lot of this stuff is happening in the United States. Go out to Dallas, Texas, where there's a ton of contract manufacturers making skincare products. And go like, you know, stick your head in and say, hey, I want to make this. Totally. Schedule a meeting. You know what happens when you schedule a meeting and fly out there? They take you seriously. Because yeah. they're like, you're spending time and dollars right. to have this meeting. You're you're real. Yeah. You know what's not real is some guy from with an email address at Gmail being <laughs> yeah. like, hey, do, uh, send, uh, like, give me this. Yeah. Um, and so like, put, put in effort and other people will put in effort. 100%. I think okay. that's all the time we've got for today. All right. There's a lot of good it. questions here, though. So maybe we'll get to them next season. Yeah, but that sounds great. I'd love season eight's that. coming soon. And uh, thank you for listening. Thank you for being a part of the Limited Supply community. And the Slack channel. And the Slack channel. If you're not in it, go to limitedsupplypod.com. And we'll see you at the beginning of season eight. All right. Thanks for tuning in. We'll be back next time to cut through the noise in CPG, retail, and e-commerce. And if you enjoyed this episode, then why not share it with a friend? 
And be sure to subscribe on whatever platform you listen to your podcasts on. 